I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In our first two readings, we hear a lot about houses and households, and it gets you thinking about what really is a house or a household. What is this? Now, when I was, uh, when I was 16, uh, one of my dad's friends bought a new house, and he called my dad, and he said to my dad, you should come over and you should see my house. You should see this new house that I've bought. And so um, my dad said, okay, how about this Saturday? We'll come out and we'll see your house. So he gave him the address and everything. And, um, and my dad thought it was strange because he thought the house the guy already had was, was a nice house. So he said, okay, let's go see it. Well, we, we pull up and we turn into the driveway. And it turns out that the driveway is like a mile and a half long. And my dad is rolling his eyes. Oh boy, what, what are we in store for here? And it turns out that my dad's friend had bought the Zenith estate, as in Zenith televisions, right? Well, the heiress of the Zenith television fortune had built this enormous estate out in Barrington Hills. And it was enormous. And, and, and the best part about this house, as far as a 16-year-old could could tell was that he, he turned his driveway into a go-kart racing track. And so it had, all of these, it had all of these markings and everything, and it was a mile and a half long. And so we get up, and there's this enormous house, and there's like a 20-car garage over there, and there are, there are servants' houses that are larger than our houses, and all manner of just over-the-top stuff. So, He's, uh, he comes out and he meets, uh, he meets my dad and I and he says, oh great, you're, you're here. I want to give you a great tour of this house. And so we begin and we're going through the house and he says, here's a bedroom, here's a bathroom, here's a parlor. And we go down a little, here's a bedroom, here's a bathroom, here's a parlor. And, and after, after about 30 of these, my dad is going, how many more bedrooms are we going to go see? And he says, only 20. The house has 50 bedrooms, and it has 40, 40 bathrooms, and it has 35 parlors, and it has three dining rooms and four living rooms. It's enormous. It has two billiards rooms. And so we're done with the tour, and it's just, it's just an amazing house, and you just keep walking and walking and walking and walking in this house. And, and he says to my dad, so what do you think? And my dad says, it's big. It's big. And he says, so are you impressed? And my dad says, oh yeah, I'm impressed. And, and so we were there and, 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 and then we went down to the garage and he took us, and there was a whole fleet of go-karts. And now I'm really impressed, okay? Because <laughs> really, to a 16-year-old boy, bedrooms and bathrooms and parlors don't mean a darn thing. But go-karts, a whole garage full of go-karts, now there is something to be impressed by. So, so on the way home, we're, we're leaving, and we're in this long driveway, and I said to my dad, I said, when he asked you, were you impressed? You, you didn't seem that impressed. I mean, geez, he had a whole fleet of go-karts and he turned his driveway into a go-kart racing track. What could be more impressive than this? And, he, and my dad said, I like this old house. And I don't like him anymore because he's got 50 bedrooms and 40 bathrooms and who knows how many parlors? You know, the reality is, and we all find this out in our lives, that houses are nice, and they're good, and they're important, but there's only so much a house can do for you, right? I mean, if you think a house is going to make you important, or whether the house is impressive, 
You're going to continue to try and build a bigger and bigger and bigger house. If that's what you think a house is for, you'll never be satisfied. And if you think that if you make your house nicer than anybody's house in the world, that that will make you important, there's no end in sight until you get to the ridiculous state of my dad's friend who bought a house with 50 bedrooms and still wasn't sure whether this was impressive or not. Now, our readings today deal with something very similar to this issue that my dad's friend had. So David, in the second uh, book of Samuel, has fought all these wars, and now he is resting, and he has built his house, a magnificent house, out of cedar. And he says to Nathan, the great prophet of Israel, I live in a great cedar house. And the Lord, and the Lord lives in a tent. Now, there is no question mark in David's statement, but Nathan, the great prophet of Israel, knows that there is a question in David's statement. And so Nathan says to him, you know what, David, go do whatever the heck it is that you are going to go do, for the Lord is with you. See, Nathan knows that David wants to build a, a great and magnificent house for the Lord. I mean, the Lord's been carried around in the ark and lives in a tent. I mean, that's, that's no way for the Lord God to live. We need to build the Lord God a magnificent big house that not only will make the Lord look impressive, but will look, make David look impressive. And so Nathan says, Go do whatever it is that you're going to go do. And then Nathan leaves and David leaves. And Nathan is there alone by himself. And the Lord comes to Nathan and says, listen up, Nathan. I've got something I want to tell you that you are going to go tell King David. And here's the first thing you're going to go tell King David. I didn't ask anybody at any time to build me a house. I, I, I have been traveling with all these Israelites for 40 years in the wilderness. I didn't once say to the elders of Israel, to the leaders of the tribes of Israel, go build me a house. No, I didn't say that at all. Said, in fact, I'm fine being on the move with my people. Just have a nice ark that you can carry and a nice tent that you can take with you. That's all I need. In fact, go tell David that he's not the builder for me. In fact, I'm the builder. That nice cedar house that David has, that's my house. I built that for David. Go tell David that. Go tell David that there is no house that he can build for the Lord God. He's not the builder for the Lord God. In fact, the Lord God is the builder for the Lord God, and I didn't ask anyone to build me a house. Now, he can go build me a house if that's what he wants, but he needs to be clear. One, I didn't ask for it, and two, he's not the builder. I'm the builder. The Lord God goes on further. Look, the house of God is not some stone temple up on a mountain. It's the people of Israel that is the house of God. And when the people of God are on the move, the house of God is on the move. There is no statue for God. God and God's house are with God's people. In fact, God's house is God's people. And Nathan basically says, God says to Nathan, look, you tell David, be king of Israel and know that I made you king of Israel, but don't confuse your job with my job. 
because I made you, and I made you king of Israel. And that cedar house, that's a house I built for you. Your job is to preside over the people of Israel, which is my true house. Now, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians in the second chapter, once again, Paul is dealing with the issue of Gentiles and Jewish Christians not getting along with one another. Once again, they're fighting over foreskins. It's a, it's a crazy fight, isn't it? I mean, it really is. I mean, you got these people fighting over it and, and all the identities they have in the world. Well, I'm a Gentile. Well, I'm a Jew. Well, if I'm of this tribe and I'm of that tribe and I'm a Roman and I'm a Greek and I'm this and I'm that and all these divisions and nobody wants to eat at the Lord's table with somebody who's different from somebody else. Paul says, look, you come to Jesus and all of that nonsense that makes you different from somebody else in the world, all of that fades away. You are no longer any different than anybody else when you sit at the Lord's table. What makes you important is nothing that the world sees as important. It is the fact that you are loved by God and that you are a member of the household of God through the body of Christ. That is what is important. And Paul goes on a little bit further. Furthermore, the only house that's really important is the household of God. And all those distinctions that you might have about where you live or where your house is or where your house is from or any of that stuff, that means zero in the eyes of God. What matters to God is that you are loved by Christ and loved by God and brought into the household of God through Jesus. In fact, what he says, and it's really profound stuff here. Where's where's Hoppy? Yes, it's powerful stuff. She's up there. That Jesus, through the cross, abolishes, knocks down all the divisions of the world. That through the cross, all of those distinctions have been put to death. And not only that, that Jesus, now listen to this, Jesus is the shalom of God, the irene of God, the peace of God. That when we enter into Jesus, we enter into the peace of God, the love of God, and all those things that pull us apart in the world go away. Then he says something even more profound. Look, look, You are the household of God. And the cornerstone or the capstone, that is Jesus Christ. And you have become his body. And you have become the household of God. Do not forget that. It's easy Paul would say, and it's easy, God would say to Nathan and David, to forget what the household of God really is. The household of God, as beautiful as this church is, and I love the architecture of this church, is not the walls of this church. It's not the stained glass windows of the church. And guess what? It's not St. John the Divine in New York City, no matter how grand that church is, and it is grand. And it's not Canterbury Cathedral, and it is a grand church, and I love it immensely. Nor is it any other church. Take a look around you, and you will see the household of God. Talk to your neighbor, and you will hear the household of God. Turn to the person next to you, and you will see the household of God. And when you give them the peace of Christ, you will feel the household of God. And when we go up 
to that altar, Jesus offers us the shalom, the peace of God, and he asks us to be bold enough to stretch out our hands and to realize what is important to God and what is not important to God. God offers us love and peace and forgiveness and reconciliation and healing, and he offers us a home with our friends in the beloved Jesus. And we go to that altar and stretch out our hands, and we know we have a household, a home of God that dwells here in us. Now, you can build all the big houses you want, and you can find as many empty bedrooms in those big houses as as you can, But you know what? I have a sneaking suspicion that many of you already know this. I don't know how many of you have downsized into one and two bedroom apartments and said my old house was a little too big for me. I gotta keep on finding God where God really is and where the household of God really is. You all know this already. You can build all the mansions to all the grand plans of all the things that the world thinks is important. And there is Christ pointing to each and every one of you. I love you. Come with me and build the household of God. Know that you are beloved. Build the true household of God. Come. Be with the shalom of God, the peace of God, the love of God, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Amen.